Hi everyone, this is Chris Safarova. Welcome to another great episode of Strategy Skills Podcast. And before we start the episode, if you want to strengthen your strategy skills, get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It is a free download. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. It is firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. And our guest today is Rich Horvath. Rich is the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and his new book is called Strategic, The Skill to Set Direction, Create Advantage, and Achieve Executive Excellence. Rich, welcome. Chris, very nice to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Rich, so let's start from how you got so interested in writing and thinking about business strategy. So about 25 years ago, and I know that's a long time, I was facilitating a strategic planning session for a group of healthcare senior leaders. And at one of the breaks, we were having coffee and a manager came over to me and said, you know, Rich, I just had my performance review and my manager said I was too tactical. I need to be more strategic. How do I do that? And so I thought for a moment and I said, let me do a little bit of research. And many of the books, Chris, that you and I have read over the years on strategy, things like Michael Porter's Competitive Strategy and Competitive Advantage, uh, Gary Hamill and C.K. Prahalad, uh, you know, even going back to Igor Ansoff and folks like that, most of those books really focus on corporate level strategy or business unit level strategy. And what I realized is there wasn't really a roadmap for individual leaders to be strategic day in and day out. Unfortunately, for many people, strategy is like a birthday. It happens once a year, there's a lot of excitement, and then it goes away for 11 and a half months. And so my passion has really been to provide leaders with practical tools and frameworks to think, plan, and act strategically day in and day out so that they could be the best version of themselves. So let's define strategic because there are so many definitions out there. How would you define it? Yes, great question. And Chris, as you know, it seems like when we go to meetings, people are throwing the word strategic in front of everything, strategic imperatives, strategic pillars, strategic objectives. And I think in some cases, we've lost really the bearing of what strategic means. So if we look in the dictionary, strategic is defined as all of a relating to strategy, which is not as helpful as we would like. So the definition that I've developed is possessing insight that leads to advantage. And if we use that definition, that then helps us filter the things that are strategic and the things that aren't strategic. So if we use that definition, possessing insight that leads to advantage, certainly a person like yourself would be strategic. A plan might have insight that leads to advantage. That could be strategic. But then lots of other things, strategic objectives, strategic pillars, they start to, to get a little bit wishy-washy there. So if we really use that definition, possessing insight that leads to advantage, I think that starts to help us think about what really is strategic in our world. What are the most common mistakes you see leaders make when they attempt to develop strategy? Well, the first would be, and I mentioned Michael Porter before, who everyone I'm sure is familiar with out of Harvard Business School. You know, his point is that most people start with something they think is a strategy, but really isn't a strategy. And so, you know, one of the things to consider is, do you have a strategy and does your team understand what strategy really means? And what happens most often is strategy is confused with aspiration, goals, mission and vision. Oftentimes we see a strategy is to be number one in the market or to be the premier provider of X, Y, or Z. And those are aspirations. Uh, when we think about a good plan, it's going to answer two questions. What are you trying to achieve and how are you going to do it? And so if we go back even thousands of years to the military arena, Goals and objectives answer that first question, what are we trying to achieve? The goal is generally what we're trying to achieve, the objective more specific. Strategy then and tactics are really, how are we going to achieve that? So they answer that second question of the plan, how are we going to achieve it? So I would say that's probably the biggest misunderstanding is really not having a definition of what strategy is 
to begin with. Um, that probably is the thing that trips people up the most. And I'd say the second thing, and, and maybe just as close, is the inability or unwillingness of people to make trade-offs. If we're going to have strategy, it's going to involve risk, and it's going to in involve us focusing and choosing things, and then just as importantly, choosing things not to do. Who are the customers we're not going to focus on? Where are the areas we're not going to put resources? So we need to really be able to make trade-offs. And I'd say those are probably the two most common areas, uh, really not having a strategy to begin with, and then the unwillingness to make those trade-offs. That is so true. I like your definition of strategy. I always for myself think that what helps you achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. And one of those things is, and it is in your book as well, is about being different. The only way to really achieve excellence is to be different. If you are like everyone else, you are not going to stand out. So let's talk a little bit more about that because I know you spend a lot of time thinking about it and writing about it. Right. So you make a good point. The word excellence, you know, if we think about what excellence is, it's deviation from the norm. That's what excellence is. It's deviation from the norm. So as a good business leader, we need to find the core competencies, the capabilities that enable us to provide excellence to customers. So that deviation from the norm, they're getting something, either a product, a service, an experience that's outside the norm of what they've received before. It's interesting now because of Amazon's operational excellence, 70% uh, of people expect any product or service they order to be delivered within two days. What, whatever they're ordering, because Amazon has created that level of, uh, of, of understanding and expectation, now people want that right away. So again, as a business leader, what we want to think about is what are the, the areas of expertise and the capabilities, the skill sets and resources we have that are not easily imitated by other people? Uh, and that provide a bit of a moat, uh, so a, a moat around our advantage. So it's not easily copied uh, by other people. And if we start with competencies and capabilities, then it becomes more difficult for people to copy what we're doing. If we come up with a new product and it's in just there's a couple features, that's going to be probably copied 60 to 90 percent within six months. But if that's built on capabilities and in, in areas of expertise, now all of a sudden we've got knowledge and skills that other people don't. So we can create platforms, we can create products or services that are going to provide that superior level of value that you talk about, that competitive advantage. Yes. The way I always think about it is you need to develop a system that is very hard to replicate, that allows you to create a lot of value for your customers and clients and also protects you from easily copying what you're doing because it's not just one thing or two things. It's a lot of things working together and feeding each other. Chris, I love that point. I, you're exactly right. If we've got a system and, and, and it's built on activities. And again, when we think about activities, those are really the fundamental building blocks around competitive advantage and strategy, because those are the things that bring, deliver, create the value that customers receive in the form of offerings. So to your point, if we have a system with six, seven, eight activities, all of a sudden, now the competitors have to say to themselves, do I want to try to replicate all six, seven, or eight of those things? Do we have the culture internally to replicate those things? And then do we have the other things necessary? So now it becomes much more difficult for people, like you said, if you've got a system involved versus just one activity or one product or service. Do you have any examples that come to mind from working with clients where they were able to develop a system that is very hard for competitors to replicate that allowed that company to deliver superior value? Sure. Without uh, without sharing a name of a company, um, I've worked with a healthcare organization and they were in the um, technology space of healthcare. And one of the things that they realized was they were doing work with blood pressure, blood pressure monitoring. And so, you know, we we all know the blood pressure cups you put on your arm, you squeeze and 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 you get the you get the blood pressure. And that that's a, a good way to do it. However, they realized that in order for them to grow the business and also differentiate and create that system, they needed to do things just outside of that as well. So they started taking a more holistic approach to the patient. And so they started to create uh, apps for wellness, for mindfulness, things that would reduce stress in people's lives, because 
oftentimes medical device and pharmaceutical companies, they think just about the, the molecule or the, the, the machine that's going to change, but they, they started to take a more organic approach uh, and really look holistically at the person. So they created uh, they created apps. They created a, uh, oh, this was a while ago. So they created a 1-800 phone number. They've since developed a website that has a portal uh, for patients uh, to go to, to talk about, uh, to share. Uh, so there's a forum there that they can share with other patients. Um, there's also advocacy groups that they've connected as part of this system of activity. So to your point, you know, I, I saw a company that started with just a, a physical product and they said, we need to think beyond that. And then they created this holistic approach that had a system of things that really approached the patient as a person at an organic level versus just another person using a, a, a machine. That makes a lot of sense. So you probably come across a lot of clients where they have a lot of leaders within the company who are not strategic. So let's talk about some biggest challenges a company faces when the leaders are not strategic. Yes. And so it's a good point. You know, one of the things we consider, I think, oftentimes is we equate someone's title with their level of strategic expertise. And I developed a, uh, a tool called the Strategic Quotient, or SQ, to help us measure mindset and behavior so that can, we can really hone in on who is strategic and who's not acting strategically. And interestingly, the first 2,000 people or so that have taken it, the average score is about 69 out of 100. So there's a ways to go, I think, for people to really behave strategically day in and day out. I would say the biggest thing that we see at a senior team level is ironically, not communicating their strategies in their different functional areas or business units with one another on a, on a regular cadence. Too often, people are moving their time and their people and their resources down this path, and others are moving down this path, when in fact, they could have both been going down this path. So I would say the first lesson really for people is how often are you having intentional strategic level conversations, not talking about tactics, not talking about operations, but strategic level conversations to your point about the things that are going to drive competitive advantage. How often are we meeting with and talking with people and, and aligning our strategies with one another? That's probably the biggest thing is, is, is really spanning those silos that we have internally and being able to drive um, those levels of conversation. And I would say probably the other big thing that, that trips up executives when it comes to thinking strategically is just this activity mindset. We always have to be ac active. And what I like to do is remind people that in your meetings, it's not typically the solutions that come right away. It's the best questions that really are going to elicit the insights. So I would recommend to leaders out there, spend the first five minutes of your meeting writing down the most effective questions that you've said or heard in the last couple of weeks, and then share those questions and select one or two of those to drive the conversation. If we do that, we're going to explore more areas because typically we get in these mental ruts and we lose our perspective on other areas of the business. So I would say those would be the, the, the two things to, to really consider is, you know, using questions uh, more proactively and then having those intentional conversations on a regular basis. And I love how you brought in some humor in describing leaders who are primarily tactical or unstrategic by saying that they have similar traits with the zombies. Yes, right. So... Again, you know, zombies have become very popular in modern culture with television shows and, and things like that. And I, I think what happens is, and, and many of us potentially have been in this situation where we've been in the strategic planning process. And if, if, if it's not facilitated skillfully, you know, uh, two, three hours in, there's this glazed look on people's faces and, you know, they become zombie-like because they're, they're, they've lost their zest for the, the, the subject matter at that point. So, you know, in order to avoid that, we've got to just think of a couple things. The first is we've got to focus, you know, as a zombie is, is wandering aimlessly everywhere. And as a good leader, we want to focus our team. We want to give them guardrails in order to drive the activities of our team. So those guardrails allow for flexibility, but they also say this is the direction we're, we're headed in. And then the second thing I think what happens is, 
you know, a zombie is is willing to really to to eat or chase anyone. But a, a good leader is not one that's prone to the shiny object syndrome, where we're chasing things that that pop up here and pop up there. We 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 have the discipline to stay focused and use our resources in the areas that's going to drive the greatest superior value for customers. And we we don't get distracted by things that aren't going to drive that value. And again, it's it's easier said than done. But I would say those are a couple of the things that that really prevent us from from losing that. And then the other piece too that that prevents us from falling into that zombie like approach to planning is just really ensuring that we've got new insights driving our plans. And an insight I define as a learning that leads to new value. So a lot of the best companies I'm working with today, they're creating accountability for insights. So their people are having to send in or share three to five insights a month, three to five learnings that have led to new value, specific value. And now they're sharing this across the organization and exponentially accelerating uh, their learning process as well. So if, we, if we're able to update our plan with new insights on a regular basis, that also helps us avoid that zombie-like approach to planning. And when you are working with those clients, you probably see the insight that they post. And it, I can imagine that is an exciting reading experience to see all those insights. So someone lived an entire month and all the things they read and all the people they speak to, they had to pick three top insights. And then you can see those insights from various people. I would love to read those documents. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and I do have people share that. So if I'm working with a leadership team, I say, before we meet, I want you to send us three insights. And I compile those and I send those out to the team. And to your point, Chris, people are really excited coming into the session. So that would be a tip I'd share with people is before you have your strategic planning meeting or your staff meeting on strategy, have people come up with those three ideas, those new ideas, those insights that have helped them drive new value. And then compile those, send those out for people to look at beforehand because it stimulates people's ideas. It's it's great food for thought before they even get into the room. Do you have any most memorable insights that come to mind from those exercises? Yes, I, I do actually, now that you mention it. I was working with a, uh, a medical device company about 10 years ago, and they were focused in the cardiovascular arena. So, um, uh, you know, heart heart products primarily. And we, we started doing an exercise that I call the value mining matrix. So if you think of a simple two by two matrix, and you've probably done this before, Chris, yourself, one, one axis, we have customers and one axis, we have needs. So customers and needs, and then they're either current customers or current needs or potential customers and emerging needs. And so one of the things that came up for potential customers with emerging needs was that they, they a lot of their sales reps were in the operating room helping the surgeons with their cardiovascular techniques with their products. But they realized that one of the challenges from observation was that there was a lot of um uh there was a lot of liquids, tissues, things like that, that they needed to dispose of following the surgery. And they didn't really have a good solution to do that. So one of the ideas that was surfaced was, why don't we become a general disposal business of the surgical suite? So we will take anything they don't want after a surgical procedure, and we'll get rid of that for them in a very compliant, regulated way. And it was funny because in the session, I saw people rolling their eyes, moving their head. I even heard one person say, we're a cardiovascular company. We don't do that. But interestingly, they, they followed up on that idea. They did market research. Uh, they did a prototype. And they came up with a solution. And three years later, that was a $100 million piece of their business. Now, it wasn't the biggest piece of their business, but it was a, a, a relatively good contributor at that point. So to your point, I think going into these sessions, we've got to really open our mind up and, and, and really approach them as an explorer, right? If we're an explorer, we, and going back to Christopher Columbus and other people in history, if they stayed right by the shore, what they knew, 
they weren't going to be successful. They had to take a risk and go out and explore, get beyond the shore. And that's what I'd say we as leaders need to do is going into these meetings, we need to have an explorer mindset. And rolling eyes shows that someone is closed off. Yes, exactly. You've seen it before too, I'm sure. And and again, as a leader, we need to be very conscious of our, our body language and you know our emotional intelligence. You know, how are we managing ourselves? And are we giving people that opportunity? Or, or to your point, are we rolling eyes and closing potential conversations off? How do you manage with a situation where you have this meeting with clients and you see leaders are rolling their eyes? Because, you know, if that is happening, people are closed off. They are not doing what they're supposed to do to make this meeting effective. Yeah. So what I typically do is I said, you know, let, let's take a quick time out. And I want to share with you a couple examples of leaders and companies that were in one area and then all of a sudden found other peripheral parts of business because they were open to other ideas and other ways of doing things. So, you know, we might bring up uh, Amazon, for instance, and obviously an online retailer, very successful. Uh, and again, if they would have been a closed-minded company, they would have never developed AWS, the Amazon Web Services business. They would have said, look, we're an online retailer. We've got to stick to stick to our knitting is what people say. But they were open to other ways that they could use their capabilities and, and competencies in order to create value for customers. And at the end of the day, that's what a business is. It's really a value creation and delivery machine. And so to say that we can only deliver nails when people might want bolts and screws and hammers and drills and chainsaws, you know, we're limiting ourselves. So what I try to do is I share one or two short examples like that to say, look, we need to open our minds because we there's lots of opportunity out there. That is very smart because then who can argue with Amazon? Right, exactly. So that is a quick way to fix this problem in the yes. very smart. Yes. So let's talk about characteristics of a good leader. Since leadership is such an important element, you can come up with a very good strategy, but if you don't actually implement anything correctly, nothing will happen. So implementation becomes crucial. Strategy is very important, but implementation is crucial. So what are some of the things you observed in clients you work with that identify someone as a very, very effective leader? Yeah. So I, I you know, I define leadership as the ability to set direction and serve others to achieve goals. And so if we're setting direction and serving others, that means we need to really listen to them. One of the big mistakes I see leaders potentially make is they believe leadership is still authoritative. It's, it's I give orders and you execute the orders. But in, in companies today where we have a lot of people working remotely in hybrid situations, that's not going to be as effective. So I think the first thing that a good leader does is they engage their people in conversations about the key business issues. And what that does is it creates a deeper level of buy-in for for people. And what's interesting, Chris, is you know, research in the social sciences has shown that when we give people a reason for why we want to do something, their acceptance rate goes from 60% to 94%. And that's even if they don't agree with the reason that we gave them, but they understand the why. And so I I agree with you. I think strategy and execution are both critically important. And in order to execute well, people have to, to understand the why. Why are we doing this? And again, you can't send that out in an email. That needs to be in a conversation. So while it takes longer to have conversations with people, that's going to drive the greatest level of commitment. And, that, and then I think the other part of that is, is being able to communicate the strategy in a simple, memorable way. If I'm going to execute something, and Chris, you told me six months ago, you provided this, this really cool analogy that our strategy is like a, uh, is like a, a, a metal cord with three interwoven strings. And those three metal carbon fiber strings are customer experience, operational excellence, and product leadership. And I, and then you send me a metal strand with three coils. Now, 
I remember that six months later. So when I'm executing the strategy, I've got something in my mind. And then I think the, the third piece is really, you have to have a simple one or two page plan to execute the initiatives. And, and Chris, I know in, in your book, The Strategy Journal, you've done a great job of giving people lots of different ways and resources to, to, to analyze the business, to execute, and to think about ways to measure. And so I would certainly reference, you know, your book is a, is a great one for people to, to access, to look through that. But I do think uh, people need a one or two page document that sits on their desk, or sits on their 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 computer screen and they can go through and say these are my execution activities for this week because if we've got that and that that can then link to our bigger plan now we can be sure that we're driving daily to the things that really matter that makes a lot of sense and so many people they are unhappy in their careers and they can immediately become much more happy if they just took the time to think why they're doing it and connecting it to some value that they're delivering to their customers and broader to the world. And of course, leaders need to make sure that it is communicated and those conversations are taking place, that people have that sense of mission and the sense that what they're doing is not just they come in at nine o'clock and leave at five and try to make enough money to go on vacation but uh, that they are actually doing something with that time to create value and move the world forward. Right. Yeah. And I love your idea there, Chris, of, of connecting purpose, you know, mission, vision, values. And, and, and certainly organizations have mission, vision, values. But I would really encourage, you know, everybody out there, individuals, to identify what you, what is your mission, your personal mission? What are your personal three to five values? What's your vision? Where do you aspire to be in 10 to 15 years? Because the, the, the more that we dive deep into our purpose, the easier it is to connect to the organization's purpose. And I think the reason that you know the Gallup polls and the Gallup research shows that so many people are disengaged with work today is because there's they lack that connection between their personal purpose and the organization's purpose. And if we can start to find common ground in values and mission and vision, now all of a sudden we can say, hey, this is an exciting place to be. And I wake up in the morning happy because I, I'm, I'm using my gifts that I've been given purposefully in a way that's helping in an organization that I believe in. And also when you have a, a mission, it gives you energy to do more. And then it's easier for you to be above average performer. And then your career goes well and you get positive momentum and you can build on that positive momentum and then things just start building up from there. Yes, you're exactly right. There's a virtuous cycle that happens when we're able to combine all those things and you know it becomes this flywheel of, of, of momentum and lots of good things start to happen. Resources come in, new ideas come in, new relationships, new connections all of these things but we've got to we've got to stop and take the time to really think about what is important to us i loved your approach with clients of asking them to extract insights from their life from their work and share it with the team and i think that is something that more people need to do and yeah. also we do share within even terms consulting strategy training.com we share insights all the time on a daily basis I think it is such a such important thing. And let's dive in a little bit into it so that our listeners know what specifically they need to do. If there's some resistance that they're currently feeling in terms of, I'm not quite sure what kind of insights, where should I look for them? Let's just unpack it a little bit because I think this can be one of the big things someone can implement on Monday morning, 8 a.m. And well, in terms of starting to do it and it can make a big difference. Yes, yes, I, I agree. And I, I love the, the the examples that you shared. So, you know, based on, on what you shared, I would say the first thing people need to do is find a place that they feel would be convenient and comfortable for them to record those insights. So uh, I use a, I use mind maps, uh, which are, are very popular. Uh, you can use an, uh, an app like Evernote or your notes app on your phone. But first of all, find a place that you say, I'm going to put my insights here. Then if you haven't done it in the past, I would recommend um, having either a symbol or a note card on your desk or, or with you uh, most times that acts as a trigger for insights. So the, 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 the token I have on my desk is a, a small 
figurine of Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes, we all know, is a character, um, you know, who was a detective. And so I use that as a reminder on my desk to say, what are the questions I've asked today that have elicited insights for me? So you don't have to put a Sherlock Holmes figurine on your desk. Maybe have a note card that says, what, what did you learn today? What were three things you learned today? And then put that in your document, uh, wherever that might be. And then the key I found is once you start to do it, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, it starts to build this momentum. And what you'll notice then is themes start to rise up. So now I, I look back through my insights from the week and I see I've got three or four around my competitor. I've got a couple around my customers. Maybe I have one about my culture and my company. So now you can start to create categories for insights. So competition, market, customers, culture. And what happens then is now you're building your expertise. I mean, the reality today is most of us are paid for our expertise. And expertise, the foundation of expertise is insight. It's those learnings. So that's why I think you, you mentioned it's so powerful is that we've got to be able to collect those insights, then categorize those insights. And then just as importantly, we need to channel those insights into value for our company and for our customers. So we always want to ask ourselves, what does this mean for my customer? And your customer might be internal or it might be external, but we want to look through those insights and say, what does this mean? What's the value for my customer here? And then as a leader, we want to find a good way to share our insights on a regular basis. So some companies I work with have created an intranet uh, where people post their insights. Some people send out a weekly newsletter or a monthly newsletter, and, it, and there's an insight section that's captured. And then some people will send out a document, like you said, and it will have categories, competition, customers, market, and so forth. So I think those would be really the takeaways is number one, create have a trigger on your desk either a figurine or a note card. What did you learn today? What were your questions that you asked? Secondly, have a place that you're recording those insights. Third, categorize, start to categorize them. And then fourth, start find a, find a way to share those insights with other people. And I guess, I guess the fifth thing I would add is then start to create accountability. So don't just do it randomly, but ask your team, share three to five insights each month uh, with yourselves, with the, the rest of the organization. So now that we've created accountability, those five things really give us a good cycle to work through. Very true. I think another thing we need to touch on is where to source those insights. Because mm -hmm. I want our listeners to make sure that they don't just limit it to working hours, but actually look for it in everything they do in life. Uh, agreed completely. Chris, I would be interested, uh, you know, with your wealth of knowledge, what would you consider one or two of your uh, best resources for insights? Anything that would come to your mind? So for me, I think it is conversations with people, then also looking at different other spaces, so different industries, how they do what they do. For example, in the industry, I'm currently focusing on, for example, why are we doing it this way? What can we borrow from that other industry to deliver more value to our customers? Because if you deliver more value, then you can have happier customers and clients. You can have longevity for your business. You can have resources to reinvest in your business and then continue growing. So I think one of the biggest sources is looking at completely different spaces, mm -hmm. how things are operating there. What is the system? I always try to understand the system how the system is working. I actually try to understand it in everything, even if there is a health issue, I try to understand, okay, what is happening in the body that is causing this particular symptom? Yes. And then unpack it from there. Similarly, in business, you're kind of looking at completely different spaces, completely different systems, and you understand how the system is working. Mm -hmm. And then you start seeing similarities between your system and that system, and then what can you adapt in your system? Yes, and so I love those examples. I, you know, I think conversations, like you said, and then looking at other arenas, both great areas. Uh, one of the things that I, I find interesting is uh, there's Masterclass, which is uh, you know an online platform that has different uh, different 
uh, thought leaders from areas. And so, you know, I, I, if you watch a, a masterclass from Jodie Foster, the actress on filmmaking, you may come up with some insights. Uh, Hans Zimmer, who has written the, 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 the music for many, many of the movies that we've watched, whether it's The Dark Knight or uh, Tenant or whatever it might be, you know, how does he approach writing music? Um, uh, Gary Kasparov, the world chess, former world chess champion, uh, how, you know, how does he think about a chess opponent and how might we apply some of those? So I love your idea of thinking of other domains and other areas and other other thought leaders, other experts, and then trying to take some of their best practices and use that. I think that's a great way to stimulate insights. I think, you know, reading in other areas as well. So, you know, certainly most of us are reading the, the typical, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review and MIT Sloan Management and Strategy and Business and McKinsey Quarterly and all of those, those publications. But are we reading things in architecture? Are we reading things in engineering? Uh, are we reading some of those publications? Those might give us ideas as well. So I, I agree with you. And then the other the other area I found great insight in is observing people, observing customers, observing uh, people who are good at customer service uh, in their jobs. I think if we I think if we observe and then write down our observations, oftentimes that's going to be the genesis of good insights as well. So to your point, conversations, looking in other domains, finding experts and thought leaders in other areas, and then really that habit of observation, um, being still and observing someone for a minute or two minutes, especially a customer, boy, that can produce great insights. And even thinking through the critical path that your customer is going through from the time they came across your company to the time they become customer and how they remain a customer, they journey with you. And if you do that, if you yourself Go through that in your mind, go through that process step by step by step. You will start identifying some things that, you know what, I actually would not enjoy that. I would like it that way. And then you start tweaking your system so that your customers have a better experience. Yeah, exa exactly. I think, you know, it. It's a it's a it's a trite comment about you know walk uh, walk a mile in someone else's shoes and we've heard that for 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 eons, but it is true and and it's amazing how often we feel we're too busy to do that to stop and really walk in another shoe to really have a deeper level of empathy for what people are going through experientially because the reality is whether it's a it's a simple transaction online or we're walking into a store there's an experience happening in every encounter and we can shape that experience if we take the time to do it very true and now i think we need to address how to make sure that with all those insights that someone is generating and writing down and sharing that you will not start getting distracted and chase a lot of potential opportunities and then not achieve what you need to achieve. You have a strategy, you figure it out, okay, this is how I'm going to achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. And then you go through the critical path towards the goal. But then at the same time, how do you balance it with all the insights you're generating? Right. Yeah, it's a great point because that can be a fine line sometimes. And what, what I would suggest is, we want to we want to keep three things in mind. We want to keep in mind our customers, our our competition, and our capabilities. So if we think about that triangle, customers, competition, and capabilities, then when we if we use those three things as as our sandbox, let's say, we can start to put ideas in that sandbox and say, number one, do we have the capabilities to pursue this opportunity? If we do, let's go to the second part of the sandbox. Will the customer find value in, in that activity, that initiative, that product, that service? And then third, to your point, if we look at the competition, do the capabilities and the value we provide, will that be distinct and sustainably distinct, creating that sustainable advantage for the for a, for at least a long enough term for us to earn our our uh, the the right the, the right level of investment back on that. So that's the what, what I would typically say is a good starting point is think about that triangle of customer capabilities and competition. Put the ideas through that filter, 
and then see if those questions um, throw the idea out or if it keeps it in. If it keeps, if if it stays within those three, and our, we've we've had positive answers to each of those three, then I think we can do a little bit more digging, do some market research, and and really start to look at is this something that's going to potentially be a big enough part of our business down the road where we want to invest those resources. Very true. And then how do you do it while still executing everything you need to execute? Maybe you need to hire somebody who can be responsible for focusing on this new opportunity and then exploring it in the initial stages to see if it has legs, if it has any potential. Yes, I think that's a great recommendation. Uh, too often, I think we go right from you know zero to let's do a national rollout and we don't do any type of piloting or prototyping. And I think, like you said, bringing in another resource, whether it's a contractor or somebody full time, have them explore it, test it, measure it. Always a great way to proceed uh, in a step like fashion. And in testing new things, there is some advice out there that I not necessarily agree with, such as if you're not failing a lot, you're not doing enough. And I know you mentioned similar things. You mentioned fail fast and fail often. So let's talk about some myths out there that misguide leaders and organizations. Yeah. So, the, you know, I think there's a number of myths. The, the, one of them that comes to mind, you mentioned a couple, is just, is, um, the the you know our need for consensus that we've got to have consensus for the big decisions and you know history just does not support that if you look at the big innovations historically it has not been a big consensus driven uh, uh opinion that that led to that it's typically somebody who's a visionary that understood intuitively what the value is they did the research, they understood what the, the basis of competitive advantage would be, and they made that decision. Too often in organizations, leaders are unwilling to, to make a, a decision because it involves risk. And there's a lot to lose when you're a leader of a, a bigger organization and you've built it up. But the reality is you have to, in my mind, you have to clarify decision rights in the organization. Who owns what decisions? And once you do that, then you have to give people the authority and the latitude to, to make those decisions. Um, so I think, again, you know, if, if, the, if leaders out there are always seeking consensus, you know, there's a difference between a voice and a vote. You know, a voice is, yes, I want to get input from my team. They have good ideas. But at the end of the day, if you're the leader who owns that decision, make the decision. Don't feel like you've got to bring everybody else in. So I think that's probably a big one. And then you talked about the, the the fail fast one. Again, the research simply does not support that. When you look at uh, different areas like medicine, you look at uh, entrepreneurs, what they found, there was an interesting study of 8,400 entrepreneurs. And what they found was that entrepreneurs that failed and then started a second business were less successful in the second business than entrepreneurs that just started their business. Um, it's same thing with surgeons. Surgeons who 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 were not six who were less successful than their peers continued to be less successful than their peers. So it's it sounds fun and cool to say fail fast and go do something else, but the research really doesn't support that because as as uh, as as Mark Andreessen and Peter Thiel and Jack Dorsey have talked about, oftentimes a business is so complex. We don't know why it failed. We don't. There's so many moving pieces that if you're not really intuitively there, we might not really know the exact reason it didn't succeed. So again, I think instead of fail fast, what I what I like to tell people is think first. So think first. Get your team together. Think through the issues. Chris, you're a big fan of the systems, right? So let's think about what's the systems involved here. And let's break that down so we really understand that at a foundational level. Then once we've understood the system, we can say, yes, we're going to make this calculated risk. We're going to try this. And if it's not successful, certainly we can recalibrate. But the goal shouldn't be to fail fast. The goal should be to think first and succeed. It makes me think of a realization that I had sometime in my career. And I wish I knew that at the beginning, but I think it happens as you grow as a professional. At some point, I just realized that I need to be very, very careful in listening to what people are saying and always primarily listen to myself. 
because looking back, I could see a lot of situations where I got an advice, I heard something, even if it is something that is repeated by a lot of people. And then I knew it was wrong. I went with what was recommended and it did not end up in good results. So I think that a good piece of advice for everyone is be very careful in terms of listening to your own voice mm-hmm. and trust it. Take yes. all the advice you can. But if someone telling you, if you're not failing enough, you're not doing enough, you need to fail a lot more, just think for yourself. Does it make sense? Hold on. Right. I, I love that. I love that. So that's such a great, a valuable piece of advice is to trust, like you said, trust your intuition. And and I th- like you said, I think too many people are just willing to take that unsolicited input and just immediately apply it. So I, I think that's a great point you brought up. Rich, is there something that you wish I asked you and I didn't? Well, this has been a really thought-provoking conversation. And as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of your work. So it's been uh, an honor to be with you today. You know, as I think about, um, you know, just strategy in general and, you know, where it's been historically and then where it's going to today and you think about AI and some of the things coming in, you know, I I guess the one thing to consider is... um, you know, we we don't want to be too reactive to trends in the marketplace, and we don't want to mistake trends for strategies. So while AI is absolutely going to be a huge force in most of our lives and most of our businesses, we still need to have strategic direction that umbrellas all the things we do. And AI is potentially going to be a component of that, but let's not mistake that for our strategy. I'm reading now in the, in in different journals of people saying, well, you know, AI is going to be our strategy moving forward. And that's not not a strategy really. It's it's going to be a component of your strategy, but again, your direction needs to be at a higher level. So really just, you know, continue to to have people elevate their thinking, be get out of that tactical weeds of the business and understand the difference between trends and strategy. Yes. And I'm always coming back to how do I create more value for my customers and clients and for the world? Because when you do that, firstly, you do good things for the world, which is very important. We really need people right now who will help move the world forward. And then secondly, it allows you to generate revenue, invest in your business and have a sustainable enterprise that you can grow. Yes. And to your point, Chris, I I do that exactly. In the morning, I typically try to write down who are three people in my personal life that I'm going to bring value to today and who are three clients or customers or people in my business world that I'm going to try and bring value today. You know, the more intentional and purposeful we can be on bringing value to others, the the better off that we're all going to be. Exactly. I think that also when you approach your work with this intention, you have even more energy to actually do great work. Exactly. I mean, I've been doing this for 21 years. I know you've been in business for a long time as well. And, you know, we we need the emotional component in addition to the business acumen. We need the, the, the inspiration. We need the motivation. And to your point, we find that in value, in bringing value to others and potentially receiving value. That's where it, that's where the, 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 the key lies. Very true. I think this is a great place to end this session because it's such an important message. I think that it can make a tremendous difference. If anyone listening right now, if you are focusing on how do we make more money? How do we cut our costs? If you're just focusing on that and you can also add a focus on how do I create more value for my customers and clients? How can I, through the work of my company, move the world forward? I think that just even this change can change someone's trajectory, trajectory of their career, and then also trajectory of the organization, especially if they are higher up within the organization. That's very well said, Chris. Thank you so much, Rich. Such a pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for being here. For everyone tuning in, our guest has been Rich Horvath. Check out his book. It is called Strategic, The Skill to Set Direction, Create Advantage, and Achieve Executive Excellence. And if you want to strengthen your strategy skills, get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It is a free download. You can get it on firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. And firms consulting is basically consulting firms 
switched over, say this firms, consulting.com forward slash overall approach. Rich, thank you again so much. Thank you, Chris. I enjoyed being with you. And for everyone tuning in, thank you. Take care of yourself. And I look forward to connect with you all very soon.